is when we go to define fitness and figuring out how to improve that without undermining health because you can do that. Now the way we define fitness, there's actually a written definition in the book. The one that I like best is a fellow named Arthur Devaney coined the term physiologic headroom and I love that term. And what physiologic headroom is, is in terms of physical output, is the difference between the least you can do <coughs> and the most you can do. Over time, most people in modern society have something that goes like this. And when you reach the point when the least you can do equals the most you can do, that's called dead. <laughs> okay? So physiologic headroom is to create as much space between your highest output and your least output at rest, to have that capability. <coughs> um, but it is possible in the process of trying to gain fitness to undermine health. And you can do that acutely by injury. <laughs> and the problem is that exercise, its relationship to the body is what you see on the water cooler back there. Exercise does not produce any direct result on the body in terms of a response. Okay, you've seen it on TV. The ab roller will firm and tighten your abs. No, it won't. It does not have any direct relationship to your body. Exercise is a stimulus that produces a perceived threat that your organism, your body, will make an adaptive response to. Okay. For an adaptive response to occur, the stimulus intensity has to be sufficiently high. Now, <clears throat> the catch is, there's a lot of literature out there, new literature that's included in my book that says, if you want to train your metabolism, if you want to increase your oxygen uptake, it is just as efficient to do sprint interval training as it is to do long-term steady state activity. You can do bursts of 30 second sprint with 20 to 30 second rest intervals do that for five or six cycles twice a week and be equally as effective as 45 minutes of steady state activity done five days a week. Great. So now we've taken down the anabolic catabolic balance part of the equation adequately well. But the problem is, is the acute component of that. When you're doing almost any form of exercise, when you go to raise the stimulus intensity, you also exponentially increase the forces that your body has to encounter as a result of that. So when you go from walking to jogging, the impact forces go up. And when you go from jogging to sprinting, they go up even more exponentially, so you're at risk for acute injury. But you're also at risk for chronic injury because those forces over time, those crows will come home to roost at some point. And I've had people have the argument with me, it's like, I've been running since the 70s, I'm 60, 70 years old, and I'm still... That's true, but the crows do eventually come home to roost. Almost everyone's running slower. If you pick up any copy of Runner's World, there is almost always an article in there on, energy, uh, on injury management. Okay? So you have acute and chronic problems because to try to raise the stimulus intensity to meet that requirement, the forces go up. Well, the cool thing with what you guys do here at Efficient Exercise is a very unique twist on this, is that by controlling the repetition cadence that you're using, very slow, very smooth, very controlled, with machines that track your muscle and joint function, you keep the forces on your body very low while you're bringing a very aggressive stimulus to your body in terms of fatigue. And here's the cool thing, is the harder it gets, the safer it is, okay? Because remember, this is the weight you select, okay? Tanner plugs the weight on the machine, you start lifting and lowering. Your strength starts out up here, and as you're working, you're fatiguing muscle and you're getting weaker and weaker, until the point where your force output is now less than the weight that Tanner picked for you. That's when you reach muscular failure. That seems like the most dangerous point in time. But at this point in time, your force output has now dropped below even the weight selected. So 
you have something that brings a very demanding stimulus to the body for it to make an adaptive response, but it's done in a way that's safe, and the harder it gets, the weaker you're getting, and the less force you can bring to your body to produce acute injury. Now, where you're going to get hurt, if you were going to get hurt doing this, which is very unlikely, is at the very beginning and the very first rep where your force output is the highest. But this is a very new and unique twist on things to bring a strong enough stimulus to the body, yet do it in a safe way so that you don't have risk of acute forces. The other unique thing is when the stimulus intensity is this high, we are demanding a big adaptive response from your body. You're synthesizing new muscle, and you are upregulating enzymes in the totality of your metabolism, not just the aerobic subsegment that exists in the mitochondria of your cells, but everything, glycolysis, beta oxidation of fatty acids, all these different metabolic cycles have to upregulate, have to make more muscle, and that takes time. So we've also addressed <coughs> the catabolic anabolic balance. And we've also addressed the chronic accumulated forces that can cause problems long term. Because the recovery interval is fairly long. You may have to wait three, four, seven, perhaps even ten days before it's time for your next exercise session. So the delivery of the stimulus and the exposure to the force is less during the acute phase and occurs much less frequently. So you're spared from these wear and tear issues that can rear their ugly head years down the line. And particularly if you're a young person, you don't worry about this stuff. But it's coming. The, the distance between 27 and 47 went like that. And here's the cool thing. Everyone in this room or what I call the 0.1 percenters. And if you guys don't believe you're the 0.1 percenters, you need to go walk through a Walmart sometime. <laughs> um, but what I mean by that is you guys come and you pay good money to have someone come and push you through something that's extraordinarily uncomfortable in order to improve your life and your health. And that is a very rare thing. And it's something that um, I'm very proud to be part of. Um, but I guess the point that I'm making a lot is people that do that sort of thing, the way our current medical technology is going, our life expectancy is marching out further and further and further. And Dr. Alexander can attest to this from the inside of the medical world seeing it. That is an amazing thing because the general health of our populace is getting worse and worse and worse. So in the face of a general health that's getting worse and worse and worse, our life expectancy is still marching out further and further. And there's new technologies coming down the line. Um, stem cells are allowed to be funded again. There's lots of stuff coming down the line. And there are people in the longevity aspect of medicine that says anyone alive today that lives to 75, is going to live to 100 and beyond. And the only reason I bring this up in the context of what we're doing here is the long-term wear and tear issue related to exercise is going to become important if you live to 105. And I think that's going to be something that's not entirely uncommon. And it's certainly going to change the Medicare industry and the retirement industry. <laughs>